I'm really curious about your work with education, and um, I we've been talking a lot in our kind of um, weekly discussion groups about applications of contemplative practice, um, or engaged Buddhism as a kind of a general um, but very diverse category. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about um, how you apply Buddhism within a kind of an educational framework. Yeah, it's a really big, big topic. Uh, I'll try and um, be very as succinct as I can. Um, so um, I'm working with three schools, um, the two schools that Ravi mentioned, and then one in, in Chiang Mai. And the... Um, the philosophy, the Buddhist um, philosophy of education, as it were, is based on applying the threefold training of sila, samadhi, and banya, which I don't know if you're familiar with that. That's sort of telescoping the eightfold path into a training of, of sila and then uh, samadhi, banya. Um, I found that the difficulty with using that terminology in the educational sphere is that many parents um, are wary of that approach because it sounds too much like um, uh, like a seminary or that uh, their children um, might end up wanting to become monks and nuns, which is not what most parents um, want for their kids. And that's not the, the idea of the, the school or this system either. So I, I, I look through the, the Buddhist discourses looking for um, another way of expressing these same principles. And I came across a teaching what called the Four Pawana, that's B-H-A-V-A-N-A, -A -A, um, or kinds of four kinds of development. Um, which is, is basically just recasting the same principle, but it's um, expressed as an education or a development of the relationship of the human being to the material world. And then secondly, the relationship of the human being to the social world. And then the third is the education of the heart and of the emotions. And the fourth, the education of the wisdom faculty. And I found that that provided a more modern way of talking, uh, which wouldn't lead it to be a very kind of narrow or elitist um, kind of approach, which would put off um, many people who are, um, let's say, they're, they're Buddhist, but they're not sort of um, really devoted meditators or practitioners. And so wanting to um, make clear that there's no real real rift between um, an approach to education which is based upon Buddhist principles and, and the more conventional um, education, but that it's one which fills in the gaps that conventional education has um, allowed to, to, to manifest and particularly in the, um, in the attention given to the, to the heart and the emotional development of children. Um, and using that four-fold um, framework, then the, the, the subjects which are um, compulsory uh, through Thai law can be integrated within that. And so the sciences would go into, most of the sciences into the relationship between human being and the, um, and, and the material world. So a divide, a, from that um, basis then um, further develop that. So in the, in the first of those four categories, the development of the relationship between the human being and the material world, the first would be uh, the relationship of human being and their physical body. So that would include things like nutrition or sex education and, and biology and, and sports. And, and then 
expanding to relationship to those elements of the material world with which we are most um, familiar, which we have to do with in every day and with technology and, and um, possessions and money and, and so on. And, and then the outer, outer ring, outer sphere would be the environment. So those would be like the three main headings of that first category. And then the second category is using wise use of precepts and conventions and agreements in order to create the optimum conditions for growth in Dhamma. Um, emphasis on development of communication skills and then emphasis on um, uh, creating a, a, an interest and skills in, in contributing to the wider society. And then in the, so those are the two outer, um, uh, the two, we, actually, we, we have these kind of phrases like two outer, two inner. So those are the two outer categories and the two inner would be um, particularly teaching children how to, um, to protect their minds against the unwholesome dhammas of anxiety and depression, stress and so on, um, and how to develop wholesome qualities of mindfulness and kindness and compassion and um, self-motivation and patience and so on. Um, and then the fourth category, the wisdom category, is uh, starting off with basic um, critical and, and creative thinking skills and going on to some more specific Buddhist um, contemplations. So that's the, the, the overall structure, but it's not just what's being taught, but it's the whole idea of the school um, as being a school of, of learners. So one of the, there is a, um, there are texts in which the Buddha refers to the arahant or the fully enlightened human being as um, a graduate. So the idea is that an enlightened person is the person who's graduated from the Buddha's education and that everyone else except for uh, arahants are all in need of education. So we're all learners. So there's this idea of the children are learn one learning community the parents are a learning community and the teachers are a learning community and that um, we should, we should all uh, seek to learn from each other. And um, yeah, I could go on about this for a long time. Just one more point is the, 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 the key concept is, is of good friendship. And so that the teacher in the Theravada is not like a guru or a God figure. He's like, the best friend that you could possibly imagine. That's the goal, that's the idea of a teacher. Um, and trying to create like um, a community based upon principles of good friendship. Um, and that's in, in, in you know, very much part of the way the school is run. So the Buddhist influence, not, not solely in terms of um, subject matter, but um, also in the way that we live together and learn together. Thank you very much. Let me just see if I can. Yeah, and to just uh, add, I had the opportunity to visit the school when I was in Thailand this past summer, and it's uh, yeah, it's quite a nice or the Panya Pratip School, and it's quite a nice place. So, uh, I guess if any of you are interested in this kind of uh, education or just education in general, uh, perhaps consider volunteering or getting involved with the school. Yeah, anybody wants uh, coming to Thailand, you're very welcome to come and visit or even to come and stay and uh, participate in the life of the school for a time. I have a question on like, on like balancing focus on like internal versus external because I know like some people have like the conception that like Buddhism is kind of like an isolated practice where one focuses on like the self rather than like focusing like outside on like societal issues um, and then on the flip side like people who focus too much on like societal issues might like burn out and like tire themselves out so I'm wondering like where you think the approach would be to like strike the perfect balance between the two. 
Yeah, well, I, th I think most people who have any um, done any reading or any contact with, with Buddhism will be familiar with the word Dhamma or Dhamma. But um, at the time of the Buddha, the, the phrase that was used most commonly was Dhamma Vinaya. Um, and the Vinaya has kind of been lost. Um, but the Vinaya means all the ways in the, which we uh, seek to um, construct the most um, uh, conducive environment for, for everyone to grow in the Dhamma. So the Vinaya is taken to its most um, sophisticated level in the, um, in the rules and the, the, the govern the life of the bhikkhus because this was a society within a society that the Buddha created himself and could structure himself. But, the, but it's, uh, it, it's also an idea that, that um, applies to lay society and the idea of how we can um, create laws and regulations and conventions and customs and agreements um, in families, in societies in which we can support the, the growth in Tamma. So, so I think that it's been a, that um, as being like exclusively or overly focused on the individual is much more a comment on the transmission of how Buddhism has been transmitted to the West and the aspects of Buddhism that have been taken up by, uh, by people in the West rather than um, the original um, vision of, of the Buddha, um, or as you can still find it um, practiced and experienced in some parts of Southeast Asia to this day, or um, speaking about the Theravada school. So I think that, um, you know, I, I've, uh, last few years I've been uh, going to, to, to China quite a lot and speaking with uh, Mahayana Buddhists and, and monastics in, in China um, about this, you know, how, how far to um, go out to, to uh, relieve suffering in the world. And, and um, often the Mahayana uh, Buddhist friends will say, you know, there is this kind of image of the Theravada Buddhists as kind of selfish and only involved in their own welfare. So this, it is an idea or a perception that's within Buddhist communities also so I, I would say all, all that I can say is that, um, as we understand it, the Buddha said that self-development and development of the community have to go hand in hand, and that they, are, they, they mutually uh, reinforce each other. And that if you want to, um, to, to contribute to, to your community, you have to know how to look after your own mind. Because I, you know, I'm sure you, you've met people who get really passionate about doing something about injustice in society or, or some uh, environmental issues or whatever, and throw themselves into it and then completely burn out within a year or two. Um, and so they're unable to sustain that kind of um, commitment over a long period. Whereas if someone is also uh, looking after their heart, training their heart, and um, being mindful and patient, and uh, then um, they have the resources to be able to deal with all the challenges of helping others um, in a way that prevent them from getting burnt out. Also, I think that a big problem with uh, groups of well-meaning um, individuals in NGOs or in any charitable foundation tend to be attachment to views and opinions and everyone gets very um, particularly passionate you know when there's the idea I'm right and this isn't just for me this is for everybody this is for the country or for the planet you know and everything becomes up to turned up to 11 and and having that uh, meditative percept, uh, perspective on views and opinions and how attachment works and how poisonous it is. Um, I think that also can help, uh, can mean a much more constructive engagement with, with others. And again, to, to be helping in long-term rather than just 
a short-term burst of enthusiasm. Thank you, that was very insightful. And I guess I have a follow-up to that, if, if that's okay. Um, yeah, we, we read your, your text on love in preparation for, uh, for the, this session. And yeah, you talked a bit about how kind of uh, passion for, for a cause or a uh, country or something like that can like give us meaning and, and uh, like what you described just now, but it can also kind of burn us out and rob us of wisdom. And I guess we've, we've been talking in our discussions about uh, a lot of current events, mm -hmm. um, specifically what's, what's happening in the United States and, and what's happened as a result of coronavirus, uh, kind of these various injustices. And I guess I was wondering when, when these uh, emotional reactions are, are so strong and we feel so uh, strongly about the issue, how do we uh, try, how can we better see the other side or kind of avoid having these one-sided perceptions of, of, uh, of especially when we're like really passionate and inflamed by something that we see is wrong in the world? Yeah, I mean, this is, um, I, I think again, our ability to do that is, is enhanced by meditation practices in which we're learning to take a step back from views, opinions, thoughts, emotions, and being aware of just this flow um, without, uh, without an owner. And so that kind of less identification with our own views and ideas and beliefs and fears um, enables us to open ourselves up to other opinions and views um, and also to see them as being selfless. It's not, you know, the, not to um, make sort of demonic figures out of um, demonic behaviors, you know, not to, 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 to solidify that thing and, 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 and create this world of bad people or, and because it's, that can be very depressing apart from anything else. But I think that, um, you know, it, it's very common that we, we tend to uh, make straw men and look for the, the weakest and the most, um, you know, despicable kinds of um, expressions of, of views and beliefs that uh, we disagree with and that it's, it's good to try and say, well, you know, who is the most intelligent and, and the most articulate um, person who expresses the kind of views that, that I disagree with um, and really listen to them and say, you know, or, or some, something that you find just, how could anybody possibly think that? Or, or you know, then think, well, well then that, that is a real, it's a really good challenge to think, um, how, how would it be possible to consider that as a rational and reasonable um, view or, or action? Because in many cases, those people do feel that what they're doing um, is rational and reasonable. And how, how do you get to that point? And what are the, 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 the premises, the beliefs um, that, you, uh, that you take on board and which will make that kind of view seem reasonable because it's usually within a within the context of a larger belief system and and i think that when when you can deconstruct these things and see them in terms of thoughts and ideas which are based upon beliefs which are based upon and and then it, it just takes a lot of the the kind of the poison out of it when you see people um as you say behaving in these terrible ways and to see the the fear and the anger and the um, and the um, just the fact that someone can take on um, a, a false idea or a, um, like a poisonous belief maybe when they're young and then it just becomes part of them and then it becomes very impossible almost impossible for them to stand outside of that and even to consider the possibility that it could be wrong. And, I think as, 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 as meditators, as uh, practitioners, you know, then if, if, we, if we tend towards that side, that you know, sense of arrogance and, you know, we're always saying, well, maybe, 
uh, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. If you're someone who's very uh, insecure and and, uh, and lacking any self confidence, then maybe you need the mantra. Maybe I'm right. Maybe I'm right. But but just just finding that kind of uh, balance between um, uh, yeah that that's that sense of being right and just seeing that yeah. That's that's probably the a major cause of conflicts. You know, this sense of of being right. And in fact, some years ago, I I, I don't know if you ever. I, I, I'm afraid I can't remember the name of the book. But uh, some some scientists had uh, cognitive scientists, I guess, had isolated a particular area of the brain uh, which is associated with absolutely unshakable confidence or belief in something. And um, as I remember, um, there was a, there, there is or was a man in Australia who's absolutely 100% convinced he's dead. Um, and uh, he, he, uh, he um, participates in study sessions at the university. And, and, and you, just can't, you just can't argue him out of this belief that he's dead in any logical way because he can always get around it. Yeah, I mean, that's just true, you know. Uh, everybody, uh, most people, or almost everybody, was dead. They're not breathing anymore, and you know. But this is this is just why it's just so weird, you know. Like I, I'm dead, but like I can breathe and I can talk to you, and I, I just know. I mean, I I, I know. So that uh, that I I found absolutely fascinating that um, someone who had a, a car accident and then has somehow affected this particular area of the brain has suddenly had this. Um, incredibly unshakable confidence in the in the weirdest thing and and um, how yeah just I, I think in any way of looking and reflecting on things that just um, releases or, or reduces that sense of you know this is a person who is a bad person or is it and and there are various ways of, of looking and reflecting and um, to to do that and um, and uh, I, I think that's the only way that dialogue ever takes place when we can uh, identify and, and perhaps even uh, allow others to recognize commonalities. It may be a cliche, but I think in the end that that's that's the way that it that it works. You know, identifying and and um, and and um, really putting effort into to emphasizing commonalities between us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ajahn Hayasaro. Um, I'm wondering if you could share a bit with us about um, your path as a teenager. What, what were your questions when you went out seeking? And did you have much exposure to Buddhism before? What other spiritual paths did you explore? And um, what was that like for you? Yeah, I, I, um, I had asthma from the age of like, I think from 18 months until I was 14. So I was always kind of sickly and at home a lot. So I, um, I read a lot. So I became a real bookworm um, and probably uh, much more bookish than if I'd gone to school. And so I'd, I was like to um, be alone. I like to read a lot. And so I had a, quite a questioning mind. Um, and I, uh, I, I, I just couldn't relate to Christianity. It, it made no sense to me at all. I, I just couldn't get on with it. And, um, and so I, and I, I assumed that religion meant believing in things. And I, I didn't think that you needed to believe in things to um, like dog, religious dogmas in order to, to, to live life. Um, but then when I was, I think about 13, 14, I got this question like, um, what's a good way to live or what's the best way to live as your life as a human being? And, and that seemed, seemed to me to open up all other, a whole number of other questions like, is that even a reasonable question? Um, you know, we can talk, you know, let's say, let's say, compare two different cars, and we can say, 
oh, this is a superior car because it goes faster, because it's safer, because it's more comfortable, because it's more attractive. So we have all these different criteria to, di to distinguish between material objects. But uh, can we do that with, with a life and say, this is a better life than la that life? And if so, what are the criteria for doing that? So, so this was what the other area was, why is the world such a mess? Why is there so much suffering in the world? Why is there so much injustice? Does it have to be like this? And if it doesn't have to be like this, what is your responsibility in a human being to make it better than what it is right now? So the, these were the two questions. I, I'm probably expressing them with more, more articulately than I did at that age, but, but those were the, the two things that were really um, uh, in my mind a lot at school and and I'd also always had this absolute fascination with India from when I was small anything to do with India and and then I saw like this photograph of a, like a, a yogi you know sitting on in the in the nation that's so cool and, and then um, uh, then I read um, Siddhartha and Herman Hesse books and and then there was a movie I don't know if you ever saw that movie of Siddhartha have you ever seen that it's a German movie but the first scene is uh, it's like this lush luxuriant uh, Indian scene and then uh, you hear this sound om om and there's the young there's the young Siddhartha some sitting samadhi and uh, yeah this I got to do this so as I all, the other thing was I was living in a in a small um, kind of provincial town, and um, and I, I was constantly looking for for a peer group. I always, you know, I was always a bit, you know, not not quite fitting in with everybody else, and and uh, and it seemed to me the only group that I had any kind of sense of connection with was the hippies and. So everything all came together with like the, the love for adventure and to test myself and to learn about life and, and to we were just the hippie trail to, to India. So, um, so after, I, after I finished high school, I, I worked in a um, building site and in a warehouse and made some money and then set off overland to India. Um, so, so, and I had many adventures and, and I was all together in India for a year and um, visited different ashrams and was in Bulgaria for a while. And, um, and when, uh, unfortunately, when I went to McLeod Ganj, where the Tibetan um, community is, I, I, I had hepatitis and I, you know, I just, just wasn't up to it really. Um, and also I, I, I have this, I don't, have you ever heard of aphantasia? Do you know what that is? It's only, got a, it's only had a name for a few years now, but it, it, it means where your brain is completely incapable of creating images and colors. So I, I have zero imagery in my, in my brain. And um, it's, it's just it's people just starting to talk about this now. You know, it's this kind of like a new thing. You can look it up on Wikipedia, aphantasia. So, this was a huge obstacle to Tibetan Buddhism and, and visualization. I just, I can't do this, you know? So I was very attracted to the, 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 the straightforwardness and the, the simplicity of Theravada Buddhism. So eventually almost two years later, I got back to England and I uh, kind of a bit lost. And, and uh, one thing to another, I went on a meditation retreat and the teacher, had been a monk in Thailand, and uh, in his Dhamma talks, he would he would talk about the time that he um, was a monk, and and I thought, well, that's exactly what I've been looking for for the past two years or more, and thought, yeah, obviously this is exactly what what I need to be doing. So that led me to to come to Thailand. I think just to, uh, well, I left out an important thing earlier. Um, the, the first book I came across on Buddhism was The Way of Zen by Alan Watts. And, 
Um, and many of the monks that I know and people of my generation, you know, have a great deal of gratitude to Alan Watts because uh, his, his books were really instrumental in inspiring many people to, to begin spiritual path. And, uh, and I remember just reading first couple of pages of that book sitting on a park bench in Cambridge and, and just absolutely, yeah, just no question. This is, this is it, you know, and, this, and it wasn't like, uh, this is a kind of exotic Asian philosophy. It was just like absolute common sense, you know, there's just no, uh, no, no, no doubt about it. Uh, yeah, that's kind of just a potted version. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. I was wondering if you could, if you could comment more on the on the student teacher relationship, either in Buddhism in general or in the Theravada tradition in particular. Yeah, it's sort of a, it's a follow-on point from from um, the previous question, and in, in that uh, apart from. Uh, my realization I wouldn't be able to to uh, really develop any of the meditations based on visualization. A more substantial doubt I had about Tibetan Buddhism was the relationship between the teacher and student and how the the teacher is um, considered to be the guru or the or sort of a living Buddha um, and that kind of absolute devotion to an unconditional devotion to a teacher, I, I found that, um, um, yeah, not in, rather uninspiring and dangerous. Um, it seemed to me to open up the possibility for all kinds of corruption. And I wondered whether I would be willing to, to give myself to that kind of a, a structure. And so what particularly, it, attracted me to Buddhist monastic, Theravada monastic order, is that um, the, the Vinaya discipline uh, applies to all monks, including uh, fully enlightened arahants. There are no exceptions. So there's, no, there's not this idea that you reach a certain level um, and you don't have to do all this stuff anymore. You don't have to keep all these rules anymore because your mind is free and whatever you do is is uh, is per se enlightened behavior and it shouldn't be held up to the normal the norms of everyday behavior you know you're something else and above that now um, what I liked is that that in in, in this tradition um, then the teachers keep all the rules even if they don't personally need to do that but in order to be a good example to younger monks now if you're a, if you're a young monk and you know, you start, a lot of the rules are really kind of irritating and you think, I don't really need to do this. You know, what, what difference does this make ultimately? And you know, this is sort of the, way, the way your mind works. And then, you know, if you've got the teacher, oh, you say, oh, and then when you get to that level, you don't have to do it anymore. So maybe I'm at that level already and maybe I'm just, you know, that you can kid yourself a lot. But then when you see a teacher who keeps these this rules, uh, with great, very, you know, with uh, real scrupulosity and really carefully. And then you think, well, if he keeps it, then, you know, what possible excuse can I have for not doing that? Um, and the, um, so that's a protection for, for young monks. And, and one of the, um, the rules for a, a new monk is that if he sees his teacher misbehaving, he has a, a, a duty um, to, with great respect, to um, admonish or to express his, um, his uh, disease at what, he, what he's seeing. So there are, there are kinds of checks and balances built into the monastic, the hierarchical monastic um, system by the Buddha to prevent uh, those in power from taking advantage of, of those under their guidance. And I, I was very impressed with this. And um, I felt that it created a system which, while not absolutely kind of bulletproof, there'll always be some corruption, but as far as possible um, was set up in a way to minimize or to prevent that whenever it's possible. 
And so over the years, I would say over the past 40 years, there have been so many um, of scandals in, in Buddhist and spiritual communities um, because of this uh, uh, lack of clarity about the, the relationship between students and, 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 and teachers. And so for, for a monk, for instance, with, uh, we're not allowed to, to be alone in a room with a woman or to speak more than you know, absolute minimum number of words without another man present. So that these are, um, the, there are all kinds of rules which are, are meant to prevent even the possibility of gossip or uh, malicious, malevolent kind of um, slanders that um, you have to be very, very careful to um, maintain the integrity of that, of that connection between, particularly, you know, in a sort of heterosexual sense between the male monastics and female teachers. But whenever, I mean, a spiritual teacher is, is someone who has that, that kind of power and charisma, um, and it, it can be um, uh, very um, intoxicating for new students particularly, and that's why spiritual teachers need a very uh, clear-cut um, moral standard to prevent that um, relationship from being distorted or corrupted, and the same would work for a, a you know with a, a female teacher and, and a male student. I'm sure. Thank you. So sorry. So uh, maybe just to to add to re return to something that uh, mentioned before is. The idea of in Theravada of the teacher is of what we call the Kalyana Mitta, or is the good friend. So it's like the best possible friend is someone who um, keeps you from doing stupid things and gives you guidance and, you know, when you're about to lose it and then cheers you up and encourages you when you're discouraged and, and uh, shares and knowledge and understanding with you and is basically your spiritual welfare is his or her number one concern. That, that would be the idea of the teacher. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, would you be able to expand a little bit on what type of a friend um, Ajahn Chah was? Yeah, for me, he... Uh, he fulfilled all of the um, all of the the criteria for um, the spiritual friend. So there are various levels. Um, so in in everyday life, you know, the Buddhist idea is that we will strive to be um, good friend or Galiana Mitta to those around us, in, but in different ways. So to try to be a good friend to our parents, to be a good friend to our spouses and girlfriends and boyfriends and uh, our, our colleagues and, and so on. But in that, that sort of special or most elevated um, form of um, the, the good friend or the Kalyana Mitta, uh, the Buddha spoke of, of seven uh, characteristics. Um, and I feel that, that Ajahn Chah, at least for me, fulfilled all of those. So the first is that the, the Kalyana Mitta just um, it, um, gives rise to feelings of great love and affection in the student. And um, you, with, with Ajahn Chah, you know, we used to go around to his, his cottage and sit and uh, he'd tell stories or he'd teach us or tell us off and he'd be there to like, 11, 12, one, and you have to get up at three o'clock in the morning, you know, so, and you used, and unless you to drive you away, you know, you, you wouldn't go, you wouldn't go back to your, your hut. You just, just wanted to be there and be with him and massage him or fan him or just sit and listen and be in his presence. So, so there is that, you know, that's the most kind of guru like quality, you know, it's just that he inspires that sense of love and affection. Um, secondly, is that he inspires respect, um, and that's a that's the balance to the that kind of the affection. You know, there's that sense of um, respect and and um, 
uh, reticence around him. And, and uh, Ajahn Chah used to inspire, I mean, I'm, I'm somebody who quite, um, you know, I traveled around the world. I just left home when I was 17 and I had all kinds of adventures and never really, uh, I guess it's kind of the recklessness of youth, but I could say never afraid of anybody or anything that I can recall. And I met Ajahn Chah and I felt afraid of him. So this is kind of weird kind of thing. You have this kind of love and affection and then fear. It's not like he's trying to consciously inspire fear, but it's a fear like you say, like if you were to come across like a, a lion in the middle of the forest, you know, there's just, you know, there's just a sense of awe and uh, respect. And, and through, his, through his life and his practice and his integrity of his practice and the, the way he lived his life as a monk, you just feel this great sense of, of respect. And then the third element is that, that you feel that you become better through being with him. You feel that your defilements become uh, exposed and, and uh, become weaker. And then you, you feel inspired to emulate him and you can feel that uh, virtues within you are growing through being close to him or, or receiving his teachings. Um, the fourth is that um, the Kalyana Mitta is a great patience and endurance with his students. So, you know, students can get very, they can be stubborn and opinionated or they can be very uh, clingy and, uh, and they want to attach or you want to sort of, um, compete for your attention and so on. And, and so um, teachers have to be very, very patient with their students' foibles and, and shortcomings and, and defilements. I found Ajahn Chah really had that quality to a great extent. Then he's someone who can um, express um, the Dhamma um, in a way that is um, appropriate to each individual, each group of person is on kind of a fixed uh, way of talking, but one which takes into account the, the, uh, the background, the, the spiritual uh, maturity, um, the needs of, of each person that he speaks to or teaches. Um, and is someone who can um, express the most profound principles of Dhamma uh, in a very um, uh, clear and e easily understandable way, but one in which that clarity and ease is not the result of like dumbing it down or oversimplifying it, but a genuine um, uh, translation of something which is very uh, subtle into um, similes and metaphors and language that uh, an audience can easily grasp. Um, and the seventh quality of the Kalyana Mitra is he never leads his students astray. He never has any kind of personal agenda. I want to be um, uh, powerful and famous and, and to um, take advantage of his students um, in, any, in any way or form. So those, those are the, the seven qualities of the Kalyana Mitra on the level of the spiritual teacher, which are laid down by the Buddha in the discourse as he inspires love, respect, um, emulation. He, 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 uh, he, he lifts people up. Uh, he's patient. Um, he, he's a skilled communicator. He knows how to express the Dhamma profound Dhamma in ways that are easily understandable. He never takes advantage of his students. So that, that's, uh, that's pretty sums up, well sums up Ajahn Chah for me and those, those qualities. So. Thank you. Yeah. I see that we're running close to the end of our time together, but maybe we have time for one more question. Sure. So, okay. Well, so you talked a lot about the uh, 
qualities of a, of a great teacher. Um, I'd like to hear some more about uh, the qualities you think are important for great students. Yeah, good. But also the importance of the importance of finding like a great teacher. First of all, there there aren't that many great teachers around, um, and even if there are, even if you have the great good fortune and accumulated merit to find a great teacher, um, it's not always the best thing for you. Um, sometimes great teachers tend to be famous and they have a lot of people around them um, and there can be a lot of pettiness and competition. And uh, yeah, so it's not like you find the great teacher and now you, that's it, you know, you're, you're on the way. Um, it can or cannot be the case. And um, making that the crime because I, you know, I've been in, in Thailand for 40 years now and I've just seen so many people on this quest for a perfect teacher. Um, and then they end up, you know, completely discouraged or, or wherever they go, there's you know, this fault finding mind and they're always disappointed in, in some area or some aspect, if not the teacher, then of the uh of the the place the monastery or of the the people around the teacher and and so i as as an attitude you know that i need a great teacher um i i'm not really in support of that i mean if you do um then then great but not necessarily great either um what i think is important is is a teacher where as i i mentioned just now as you feel that there's progress being made that uh, greed and hatred and confusion and doubt and jealousies and all these kind of negative mental states are over a period of time waning. You know, it's not like a day on day thing or even a week on week thing, but you can see like a trend over and an, uh, an over a period of time and that the wholesome dhammas of mindfulness and clear comprehension and effort and patience and um and and so on the loving kindness and compassion are, are on the increase and you could say that yeah if it wasn't for this teacher then i can't see that happening so it's someone who's further ahead on the path and that you have that kind of connection with him that you find that your practice develops um i think that's a more in this day and age, that's a more practical level. The other thing is we, you know, we do have this incredible advantage of technology where now you can uh, listen and, and watch great teachers from around in Havoc, whether it's inspiration or whether it's information. You know, we have students have that access that, that would have been a dream, you know, for, for monks and meditators for the last 2000 years you know to to be able to listen and watch uh, the great masters that, that, you know, in the way that we can today it's unbelievable um, in terms of student then patience and consistency i think is um is probably key um you know often it's a trap is to just to really go on a retreat or something and really put in sort of a heroic effort for 10 days or even more and then let it sort of all fritter away and then go back and do another retreat and let that and that fritters away and and then in the end you sort of lose your confidence in in the practice and the um uh just maintaining a steady practice um day on day in day out that's in the long term that that's really important and um maintaining that that interest in learning from whatever happens in your life you know it's all um it's all it's all there to be um to be learned from so that 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 stance and that that attitude of the uh of the student in every area of life, you know, learning uh, how to be a human being, learning how to be a man, or um, learning how how to be a 
a son or her, how to be a boyfriend or a husband or a father. You know, there's so many things. And just looking at those things as like lifetime tasks um, that, that we're learning. Um, but most important is commitment to, to learning the nature of the body and mind and really understanding how the mind works, how the body works, how they affect each other. Um, and that training and um, education of our thoughts and feelings and emotions, that, that's like the heart of, heart of the practice. And the more you look, then the more you see. And, and the, the classroom, if you like, is the present moment. Um, so it's not like you're in the present moment and that's it. Now you're, you know, you're a spiritual adept. But the, the present moment is, is the environment, is the classroom in which you can do the work. So unless you can learn how to be in that classroom of the present moment, then um, there's nothing really profound taking place. So a lot of meditation practices are just learning that skill and that ability just to be in the present moment for, for a, a considerable length of time, because that's when you really start to penetrate into the nature of things and to, and to, to um, extract all the sort of wrong ideas and assumptions and attachments that we've accumulated over many, many lifetimes. So I say, um, don't expect, as a student, I say, don't expect to be inspired all the time or think that there's something wrong when you're not inspired because inspiration is also, it, it's, a, it's a conditioned phenomena. You know, we can't be, even monks can be inspired all the time. Um, but if you are um, struggling, don't always look outside for inspiration from teachers and teachings. But if you can develop that skill of, of reflection and contemplation in such a way that you can inspire yourself, then you have an incredible resource. You know, that, that um, developing that skill of inner motivation, whether it's for in your working life, your academic life, or your working life, or your spiritual life, uh, you know, th this is how I feel right now. You know, not, not how I should feel, but this is how it is. And, and what can I do about that? You know, so you, you, you're, you're just humbly accepting this is the raw materials that I've got right now. And what's the best that I can do with that? That would be my advice. There's a, I don't know if you ever read this story or heard the story about Einstein. So I tell this to school children. A, so Einstein, I mean, the story anyway, is that he went to some big conference. Um, so this is towards the end of his life, you know, where he's got that very distinctive appearance. But um, supposedly someone comes up to him um, at a conference and said, who are you? Um, and right, rather than saying, I'm Albert Einstein, how could you not recognize me? And I've got two Nobel Prizes and so on. He says, oh, I'm a student of physics. Um, and I, I think that captures that, that attitude really, really beautifully. You know, even like a world-renowned scientist and um, achieve all the accolades and fame and fortune. And yet he considers himself a student of physics and I think... Um, to, to sustain that kind of um, uh, perception of oneself is really helpful. Okay. okay. Well, thank you so much on behalf of, I think all of us and the Bruce community at Sanford um, thank you so much for coming to speak with us and lead a meditation. And also thank you to the host center of Buddhist studies for co-sponsoring this event. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I, um, <laughs> this is uh, my, really my first time. So I, I've got to learn how to do this. It's uh, an adapt to the, the new normal and, um, so uh, I hope I'll get a bit more fluent as I as I do it more more often. Uh, 
Yep, so it's uh, it's midnight here. I think maybe time for me to go and have a rest. So uh, I wish you all the best in in your practice, and uh, may you be well, happy, and uh, may the all the negative mental states in your heart wither away and die, and may all the positive mental states grow and flourish, and uh, maybe we can. Um, see each other again sometime.